I'm Pastor Amy Kinsley, and this is Sacramental, Sacramento. In the United States, the rate of incarceration is higher than in any other nation. In California, the rates of incarceration have increased dramatically over the last several decades. Black people represent over 20% of those incarcerated, though they make up only 6% of the general population, while Latinx people are 41% of those in our jails and prisons. The rates of incarceration for women rose over 200% since 1980. Prison populations are also aging, with the percentage of those over 50 years old rising nearly threefold since 1990. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus tells his followers that they care for him when they care for those at the margins. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Prison visitation and walking alongside those incarcerated is difficult work and a particular calling. For this month's episode, I had a conversation with Rabbi Seth Castleman, director of the Exodus Project, and Reverend Scott Sorensen, director of the Custody to Community Transitional Rehabilitation Program at St. John's Program for Real Change. Each of these programs accompanies women and men from the prison system back into society. Seth and Scott share their experiences working on behalf of those navigating the last part of their sentence, and also where they have seen God working in the lives of the people they serve. Welcome to this third episode of the podcast Sacramental Sacramento. I'm Pastor Amy Kinsley from St. John's Lutheran Church, and I'm here with Rabbi Seth Castleman, Director of St. Vincent de Paul's Exodus Project, and Reverend Scott Sorensen, Director of St. John's Program for Real Changes, CCTRP program, which I'll let him uh, explain what those letters mean since I continue to mess them up every time I try. So so we'll let you, Scott, uh, describe that. Um, Uh, Thank you both for joining me today. Um, I am excited to know more about your programs. I know I I toured the CCTRP with Scott uh, back in, I don't know, was it January last year or something? Um, So I know a little bit about that program and, have looked at some of uh, your program as well, Seth, online and uh, from the videos you sent, but I would love to hear more about um, the work that you do and the people that you work with and how um, God is at work in your lives and in their lives uh, and in this work that you do. So welcome. So maybe uh, we'll start with you, Seth, um, and both of you can kind of talk about your programs, introduce yourselves in however, whatever way you want, and then maybe talk a little bit about the work that you do and the people that you work with. Sure. Thank you, Pastor Amy. It's a delight to be here. It's a delight to be here with you, Scott, as well. Exodus Project is a program of St. Vincent de Paul. It's an interfaith project that is uh, at home in the, in the Catholic diocese and largely supported by the Catholic diocese. Um, they decided if they hired a rabbi, it would uh, give their interfaith credentials uh, some, some kudos. <laughs> we provide uh, reentry support for people coming out of prison and jail here in Sacramento. Um, and it came after a number of years of the Catholic Diocese increasing their uh, chaplaincy work inside the, the prisons and jails throughout the, the diocese, which stretches from close to the coast all the way to the Nevada border and up to the, up to the Oregon border. So it's a large uh, territory. And seeing that they were doing a lot of good work on the inside, but that the time that people perhaps most needed someone to walk with them was when they reached the gate and coming out. So about two years ago, we started Exodus Project, which does mentoring one-on-one and group mentoring, matching men with men and women with women to walk with people during the last weeks and months of their incarceration and for six months after they get out. Uh, We also offer other resources, um, some housing referrals and hotel vouchers and uh, clothing and furniture, uh, food and food vouchers, um, transportation vouchers, that sort of thing. The mentoring is both sort of on the internal and the external. The external is helping with employment, with housing, uh, with family reunification. The internal is sobriety, the psychological, the spiritual, and potentially the religious, <coughs> excuse me, um, to help people reconnect with a faith community if they have one or if they're interested in one, um, helping them reconnect with their families. 
helping them continue to walk a, a healthy, holy life as they return to their community. Yeah, thank you. And Scott, if you want to just talk a little bit about who you are and the program. Sure. I, I'm a Lutheran pastor and uh, have this call with the St. John's Program for Real Change, which uh, typically uh, serves uh, homeless women and their children. But in 2016, signed a contract with the California Department of Correction and Rehabilitation, CDCR, to operate the fifth uh, CCTRP in the state. CCTRP stands for Custody to Community Transitional Reentry Program. So uh, this program takes the rehabilitation seriously. We have a 50 bed facility here in town where women who are still in prison, they're still completing their prison term, but they finish the last two months to two years in this uh, transitional reentry program where uh, we deal with well, much of what uh, Seth spoke about of alcohol and drug program and mental health and so many of those uh, those sort of internal programs matched up with uh, vocational skills, money management, healthy relationships all together. So in this community setting, uh, they can go to college, they can work, uh, but primarily they, they gather the tools necessary to be successful when they hit the gate rather than hitting the gate with $200 saying, good luck. Uh, the Department of Corrections Rehabilitation realized they need to do more uh, to help people be successful uh, when they are released. So that's what this program is and it's your tax dollars at work as we uh, seek to reduce recidivism and save money and save lives. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I saw, um and the materials that you sent uh, that the program has a hundred percent success rate. Well, is that is that true or not anymore? Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> it, there was a time when a hundred percent of our parolees were uh, had zero recidivism, but that's not the case. Uh, there's a few, uh, sure. but overall, CCTRP the recidivism rate is probably around four or five percent and the general population is about 37 percent for females so statistically that makes a, a huge difference yeah yeah I'm surprised uh, I'm both thankful that California has these programs but also surprised that there's only five right and it and you know your your program has 50 beds um, and mm -hmm. then others have different numbers but it's a, such a small percentage of those that are incarcerated, and yet there's a high success rate for people. Seth, do you keep statistics that way in your program too? And do you know, like, have you seen the difference between um, those that get walked along with and accompanied in this process versus, you know, what happens when people just get released without yeah. any support? We try, and we're in the process of developing our statistics with a researcher from UC Davis, a sociology uh, PhD student. Um, we don't have hard data yet as we're pretty new as, as a program. Sure. It's also interesting, it, it might be somewhat counterintuitive, but we work with what I would say is a harder population of the ones coming out of jail, that the longer people are doing time, the more likely they are to not recidivate. Uh, and people often after five or seven years and have sort of hit more rock bottom come out and are much more likely to be successful. We're working with a lot of people that are sort of still on the hamster wheel of recidivism and meth addiction mm -hmm. and alcohol addiction and are going in and out. Uh, we do see success with about 50% of the ones that we work with and about 50% of them disappear. A lot of them have good intentions when they're in and they're clean sure. and they're in a different environment. And then once they get out, they sort of ghost us or they disappear. Um, but with the ones that we walk with, we have seen some very good success in getting some of them jobs, getting some of them housing, getting some of them back with their families. Yeah. So how do you both um, see your faith as being part of, if, if you do see your faith as being part, I, I am assuming that you do, but maybe, maybe you don't, um, but do you see your faith as part of this work and, and how do you see it relating to the work that you do? I'll, I'll try that one first. Um, I think 
uh, as opposed to a parish position, I see lives changed more dramatically and more quickly in this place than I did in the parish. Hmm. Um, that those who uh, come to understand grace and forgiveness uh, and in a world of shame have learned how to uh, forgive themselves and accept uh, that grace and embrace uh, a new life. And it's, I kind of get a front row seat to watch those, again, lives being changed um, and kind of, and they're rather raw about it. Uh, so that it is certainly, you know, Jesus talked about, uh, you know, as you did to the least of these and when I was in prison, you visited me. So there's, there's a little mandate about that. Um, and so yeah. that, that puts me in that place and also expanded my, uh, you know, my preconceived ideas of, of, of both what inmates are and uh, what a, a fully tatted person from throughout their face and everything else, what uh, might come with all, I might have all sorts of prejudging things. And so it really convicts me to, to kind of recognize and work to see God in my neighbor. Yeah, it strikes me that, you know, in Christian categories, and Seth, I would love to hear, obviously, from the, from Judaism's perspective, but, you know, it's these, when you said shame, right, like we, we say that repentance is possible, and, you know, that, you know, sin is not, like doesn't define us, right? That we're defined by being God's children and God has claimed us and have grace and forgiveness in the Lutheran tradition. But, you know, how much we both for those who are incarcerated, we, the system and the way typically it works, it seems to heap shame on people, right? And in a way that is almost, and you're not able to, even after you've done your time or served a, a sentence, you can't shake it off from what society assumes about you and tells you. And then on the other side, you know, those of us who look into that world can often, you know, it, we, we can't handle even just like small things that we're ashamed about, right? And like let go of those. And so, so it's an interesting dynamic and I'm interested that, you know, how you said, um, and I can imagine why it's true that you can see in that context lives transformed because really that is the, the hope of the program and it's, it's harder sometimes to see in churches where we're also not vulnerable and willing to face our own shame, right? So how about for you, Seth? Like what what does your faith inform about your work? And I would concur with a lot of what Scott said. I would say that more people from my experience, both with reentry but also working inside jails and prisons for a number of years, there are more people waking up whether it's to God, whether it's to awakening, whether it's to wisdom and compassion, to the divine, however you want to explain, describe it. More people are waking up today in darker corners of this world, which the prisons are some of the darkest, than in temples and churches and synagogues and mosques and meditation centers. Um, that for most people, suffering is what brings them to transformation. So for us as clergy, for us as uh, spiritual teachers and leaders, it's somewhat selfish to do this kind of work and that we, uh, as Scott said, get the front row seat to people's transformation and their good work and we get to be a part of it and that's quite a, quite a blessing. Um, and it's also very humbling. I remember the first time I went into uh, prisons here in California, both women's and men's prisons, and it didn't take me long to realize that nobody that was in prison was there for something that they had done that I hadn't on some level had the urge to do at some point in my life. Um, some of the embezzlement schemes, I'm not smart enough to have thought up, <laughs> but the desire to hurt somebody, the desire to take something that wasn't mine, the desire to, the, the, the fear and the anger that, that drive people <clears throat> to do things. Now, for a host of different reasons, I haven't uh, done most of those things and the few that I have done, I haven't been caught at, um, but, uh, but to see that we are not so different. Um, and I think that's a fundamental part of every faith tradition, certainly in Judaism, um, but of every faith tradition to see us all as, as, 
made in God's image um, and still manifest uh, of the imminent God. Yeah, and the, the title of your program, you know, Exodus Project, and I know it's a, a Roman Catholic, uh, the St. Vincent de Paul, but uh, the Exodus story is central to Judaism. And do you, do you see parallels in that, in that story to your work? I mean, I guess that's the intention in the name of the program, but how do you yes, connect those? I do. In fact, there was a few years where I was leading Passover seders in women's prisons in, here in California, and uh, a very powerful experience to be telling the story of the Exodus and the passageway to freedom with collectively telling that story and celebrating that experience from oppression to freedom with people who uh, were looking at many years or perhaps lifetimes uh, in incarceration. And uh, there's, a, there's a teaching uh, that was driven home to me. We, in, one of the, in one of the women's prisons in the Central Valley, we did the, the ceremonial part and we told the story and we said the prayers and then we were sitting down for the meal and the women saw all this food that we had brought in, the matzo ball soup and the chicken and the, a couple of the local synagogues had sponsored it and brought this food. And this was before Exodus Project had started. It was with another organization. And um, one of the women who was sitting next to me piled up her tray with the food and just started wolfing the food down at a ferocious speed. And I tried not to look at her. I didn't want to make her feel uncomfortable. Um, and she stopped for a moment and she looked at me and she said, how long do we have to eat? And I looked at my watch and I said, there's no rush. We have 40 minutes before we have to line back up again. She said, no rush. We get 10 minutes a meal. And the woman next to her said, they're supposed to give us 10 minutes a meal. They don't even usually give us that. And the first woman said, 10 minutes a meal, three meals a day, 27 years. How long is that? She said, I don't know how to eat slowly. And she tried to take another bite and she started wolfing the food down again. And then the woman next to her reached out and grabbed her wrist. And everybody in the room looked at her because of course there's not allowed to be any physical contact. And so they all looked to see what was gonna happen. And the second woman took the spork out of the hand of the first woman and she said, chew. And the first woman chewed and swallowed and then she handed the spork back and she took another bite and the second woman took the spork away. Mm -hmm. and for the next five or 10 minutes, they just handed the spork back and forth. And it reminded me of a teaching from the Passover story of the Exodus where it says that it was easier to get the Israelites out of Egypt than it was to get Egypt out of the Israelites. And a lot wow. of reentry work is about getting the experience and the institutionalization of incarceration out of the people. Yeah, well. uh, yeah, that's that's precisely what CCTRPs do while they're still technically incarcerated. So they show up, and the first thing that happens is they get changed out of their prison clothes into human clothes. Um, often it's close to meal time, and we serve with knives, forks, and spoons. And on more than, I've had one client stare at the, the butter knife and go, is this some sort of trick? Like if I reach down and touch that, am I going back to prison? Right. Others just yeah. took a fork and held it in her hand and, and stared at it and you know, remarked how many years it's been since I've eaten with a fork. Um, those little pieces of humanity uh, begin to add up, giving people enough time to eat. Uh, letting them uh, have some dignity back. Um, that, that's starting to rebuild lives. Uh, something that here on the outside we take for granted, on the inside, that's one of the things that's been taken from them. And so uh, it's, it's powerful to see those changes. And it is as simple as a knife, fork, and a spoon and right. clothing. Yeah, you know, you're making me think a lot, you know, it's, again, because you said we take it for granted, I mean, you know, um, but a knife, a butter knife and a fork as like a sign of God's grace, you know, pointing to just like, you know, connection to, to life outside of enslavement in a lot of ways. I feel like in our, the way we do incarceration typically in the United States, and of course it varies state to state and um, to some extent, um, is so outside of you know God's sense of justice. And so I don't know if you could reflect on that a little. Like, you know, I, I think 
we'd all like to see more programs like yours because I think they they live into even what or make real what we say the hope for our justice system would be right like you know that people could return to normal life or be returned to but it doesn't work that way when you deprive people of what of the things of real life out in the world and then you expect they just can come back in um and i don't you know there's so many things in our world that don't look like god's kingdom or what god wants for justice but you know what what have you seen or maybe you can i mean in some ways you've just told the story about that but are there other places where you've seen that um in the lives of your clients The, the issue of, of uh, certainly sentencing reform, justice reform, um, it, it, I see it. Some of it, uh, now make no mistake, to be part of this program, they have to be serious and violent offenders. The, these women have, have, have done stuff. Um, but I also, like the other day, we have a 26-year-old client who's been in the system for over 10 years. Uh, they've been in 12 years, you know, just over 10 years, and they have a 10-year-old boy. They found when they were arrested, they discovered they were pregnant. So the baby was born while they were incarcerated. Uh, she was given an adult sentence at the age of 16. Uh, she's getting out next year, um, but spent two days with her baby when it was uh, born. Uh, that's, is that the best we can do? I mean... Uh, we have another person who's been in the system since they were 14. Um, you're going, what, you know, sensing teenagers and some right. um, senses. And I typically don't know what their offense was unless they tell me. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I see some of these folks, whether they be uh, 66 or 23, um, and, and just wonder, what, what is our goal of the prison system? Is it rehabilitation or is it punishment? And I don't think we've, we've come to a decision on that. Yeah. I think there's also a lot that's possible that people create in community, including the community of prisons and jails, uh, including the community of returning citizens. And as one woman told me who was locked up, in here you either become a, an animal or a saint. And the choice is yours, but you're going to go one of those two directions. Um, and there are saints out there. There are saints in prisons. There are saints out here in the world. Um, and there are people doing good work, uh, even in incarceration, and are helping their neighbors and helping their community and making their lives a better place. Yeah. Yeah, so that kind of leads to my my next question is, you know, where have you seen God in your clients? Like, are there stories that stick out to you about, you know, moments that you saw? Well, I mean, in some ways that um, that story you shared, Seth, of the woman who would just stay the hand of her eating companion um, to offer a moment of grace, like you don't have to wolf down your food, right? Like that, that's, that revealed something about God to me, but are there other stories or um, things that stand out to you about where you've seen God in um, those who are going through the program? I'll, I'll, one, there's, there's several. I'll speak of one. We had, uh, in the first few months we were opened, one of our clients, uh, mid early twenties. Um, she told me her story, her born, her mom was 16 when she was born. Her mom's a active, uh, meth user raised by her grandma. And while she was here, uh, she got word that her grandma was sick and that her grandma had died. So that she got news and we're in my office, uh, and then she wanted to leave my office. I go, you're going to sit down. Uh, and against her will, she, I asked her, tell me about your grandma. And she started to tell, as people do in their grief, when prompted, we'll start to tell those stories that are uh, certainly important. 
curious one that she told me was that um, she re her mom was old fashioned. Now she's telling me this, and I'm doing the math. And her mom is about ten years. Her grandma, I mean, is ten years younger than me. But she she was old fashioned <laughs> and, and really old, and so. I'm not taking offense at this. You had to just listen, just, yeah. okay. <laughs> but then she said, yeah, she always used, one of these old-fashioned things is she always and only had gold dial soap in the house. And I remember that's all we had. And I would remember being in our storeroom, and I said, this? and after we got done talking, I went over to the storeroom, and we had all sorts of assortments of donated things. I found one bar in its box of gold yeah. dial soap. Mm. And I got to take it to her and she took it up to her nose and just mm. took the aroma in. And my thought was, you know, when God shows up, God shows off. You know, how, how else would one bar of gold dial soap show up where we needed it? And it became the connection point um, to her grandmother and, and to that life. Um, and it's, to me, no one else maybe saw it that way. I saw it as God being present, um, uh, in helping all that happen. Um, yeah. me being here, the soap being here, putting them all together and her sense of that. So th those moments happen actually, again, like I think in, in parishes, we say, if you're looking for God to be there, you might actually see the presence of God. If you're not, <laughs> you probably won't. So uh, looking for it, I'll see it. Yeah. But I just think too, for the client, you know, for that woman, it's when, and you kind of said this in your beginning remarks about being able to, again, to see those transformations like more easily maybe because there's been such deprivation and disconnection from the community by the system of incarceration. And so, you know, these little moments for people, like God breaks in in ways that when things are fine or we think our lives are great and, you know, there's nothing wrong, like we, we miss lots of moments of God's grace or a little thing, you know, and we definitely don't see the little things as, you know, God breaking in, you know, and so we often have to sit and reflect for so long and, and hear a bar of soap or, you know, a small thing can, be this connection that had been broken um, for someone. And so, I, you know, there are blessings and gifts uh, that we can see even in very difficult situations. And how about you, Seth? Have you, are there any other stories that you would share? I see it a lot through the relationship in mentoring between the mentor and the mentee. Yeah. And in the personal connection that's made and the ways that they're both growing in the process. Um, it reminds me a little bit of a Jewish teaching that uh, we have three parents, our mother, our father, and, and God, and that it takes three to, to create a, a new human being. And that in some ways it takes three also to create a, the relationship between two people so that, um, in that mentor-mentee relationship, there's often the presence of God. Now, as a interfaith project that doesn't push and doesn't proselytize religion, we don't necessarily bring that up. We don't mm -hmm. necessarily discuss it. If the mentee is interested in it, we will. Um, yeah. We'll we'll delve into it. We'll help them. We'll do Bible study with them. We'll walk with them. I sometimes say that the the longest walk for a returning citizen is 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning from from the from the sidewalk to the pew. Um, so having a mentor or somebody to reach out to the pastor or the, or the priest or the rabbi or the imam or the, um, and then to go with you can be a, another way of connecting people back with God. Yeah. So I wonder too, in this time, you know, everything has changed in our world, right? And, um, you know, I wonder, has the pandemic affected your work? I know one thing I was thinking as I looked at the materials that you sent, Scott, about the, like the partner employers, like, you know, for your program and that, you know, once people are uh, getting out of the program, where did they find work? And that, you know, all these sort of ramifications that the pandemic might have, um, how has it shifted the work you do? Um, you know, what, what has changed, if anything, 
uh, in the way that you operate and in the lives of the people? Well, for us, um, one of the Department of Corrections, uh, you know, early on in March made started making changes, and some of that was that um, all of our work workers, because out of the 50 in the house when we're full, uh, up to almost half would be going out each day, either going to college or going to work. I mean, that's that's how you learn to be in community right. as you, you go out. Uh, but they made the decision that no one can go out looking for a job now. They just stop that. But if you had a job and did not lose it, mm. uh, and that was a total of uh, nine of our clients at the time, uh, they could continue. Now there's only four left because they've, others have paroled out. Um, so that's really different. So we don't have a lot of people leaving. And people who normally in non-COVID time would be out looking for a job or working right now, and then they save that money. Um, I've had people leave here with, uh, it's not unusual to have ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 in their savings account when they hit the gate. That's way yeah. better than $200. We've had one with 30000 She worked for over a year wow. in, yeah. a, in a union job, and <laughs> which was doing great. So um, we forced them to save their money and, and that. So that's not happening now. But I have more attending college because Los Rios College is online. So I have nine college students right now. And before yeah. the most we'd have would be like four. Uh, but one of them was in cosmetology and you can't do cosmetology remotely. That's right. Uh, that changed. It also changed our intake and outgo. So Department of Corrections has slowed the, the movement. And because we've seen the negative things that have happened when they've moved folks without testing and that whole system. So um, there's a quarantine protocol and other things in place now, but we've been COVID free uh, since the start. Um, but er and it exacerbated things the last few weeks here when no one could even step outside with the air quality. Right. Um, so we work really hard about the community morale yeah, uh, I was going to ask, is morale change? Because obviously you look forward to, in a sense, being able to go to school, go out, get out. They and monthly would get to go to Walmart. And so they'd look for, you know, that's a normalizing yeah. thing. Can't do that. And there's just so many things that aren't the same. Um, so we, we have a daily community meeting and work really hard about supporting one another recognizing it's hard. Don't minimize the difficulty of it, um, but try to keep the, the spirits up. This afternoon, later, we, we do graduations for those who are our top phase fours and have made all these requirements. And so we're having our own graduation ceremony this afternoon, complete with cap and gown and complete with a dinner with tablecloths and special meals and hors d'oeuvres and the whole thing. Um, you got to celebrate, you know, got to, got to find ways to celebrate or um, let them watch Hamilton or some <laughs> other sort of special thing, you know, any, anything to help uh, in the midst of what is, uh, you know, if it feels like Groundhog Day for you and me, it's even more so for those who are still incarcerated. I mean, there's even less yeah. they can do now. Right. I mean, we all can identify, I think, with all those feelings and like with the fires and the smoke. It was like, okay, now we can't even go out and exercise. But then when that's been like something you hadn't experienced and were able to do, you know, it's a moment of, you know, experiencing something you haven't had for a long time or been able to do, um, you know, that's an even bigger loss perhaps. But we all, I think you're right, you know, we just have to learn to acknowledge the loss and not diminish it and just say, okay, you know, we need to, and that's for all of us, but certainly um, for your people there at the, in the program, but just, you know, if we can share it together and know that we're not alone in it, I guess that can improve a little bit our morale and sense of well-being. Have things shifted for you, Seth? I'm sure they have since they've shifted and everything. They've but shifted how is it? quite a bit, yes. We've been, we've been on and off uh, accessible to the jail and locked out of the jail because right. of their lockdown. So gaining new mentor, mentees, having the mentors go in and visit with the mentees has been on and off. Um, people come out and the, the employment market is even worse. 
Um, the housing market is even worse. Um, and mentors and mentees, some of them have been meeting in person and some of them haven't wanted to meet in person because of COVID. So they've been doing more uh, video chats if, they, if that's available to the, to the mentee or texting and phone calls. So it's, uh, it's shut a lot of us down uh, in, in significant ways. We have our next mentor training actually starting next week, uh, which we oh, okay. postponed because of, but we'll be doing it online. We, every six months, we do another mentor training to train a new cohort of, of mentors, but that was delayed as well. So it's been hard. We did get some additional resources to help with housing, um, motel vouchers and that sort of thing. Okay, yeah. Um, for people be, due to COVID. Have you had a reduction in the number of mentors stepping up then or? Yes, that is because well. they're also well. worried about. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. In your program, what are the ages of mentors generally like do the, is it older retired folks that volunteer or is it you know how to how does that we have a work? lot of older but we go from 25 to 81. Um, we have a 25 year old who's matched with a 25 year old young man uh, who just got out. Uh, most of them are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s is the majority. Um, we're a little weighted too much to the elder, but for mentors, it's good to have some seniority. Um, we're trying to diversify more religiously, racially. And we're about half women and half men, and we matched women with women and men with men. What facilities do you, are you at, does the jail here, I don't know, I'm not too familiar um, with Sacramento, right. like is it, is the jail both men and women or are there separate facilities? And the jail is both men and women in there, but there are two jails. There's the downtown main jail and then there's the branch jail down in Elk Grove. We're primarily taking people who have been in longer and that would be people down at the branch jail. We also do take some from CDCR who reach out to us or know about us from different uh, community resources and such, but the major and some from the federal system as well. But the majority of our participants are coming from from the branch jail down in Elk Grove. Okay. R triple C. R triple C exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, are there ways that if someone is listening, they could support either of your ministries or your work, um, your programs? What? What support do you need from us or, or could we offer uh, to your programs? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, we are looking for uh, funding. We're looking for employers who want to hire people. We're looking for uh, mentors. Um, so whether it's individual donations, whether it's business owners or uh, people who, who are hiring and or people who have eight hours a month to do some, some mentoring. Uh, people can go to exodus-project.org, uh, which will get them to all those different uh, links. Okay, great. Uh, our volunteer opportunities are a little uh, more difficult. Sure. Uh, because to come into our facility, uh, you have to um, be, it's the same as having a pass to visit at Folsom Prison or something because it's CDCR controls it. Um, so if, if someone, we have AA and NA volunteers, but they have to get live scanned, they have to have a TV test. I mean, it's, it's a lot right. to, for a volunteer. Um, but the, I would point folks over to Exodus Project because when they get out, because we can, we can walk with them pretty well until they hit the gate. Uh, right. But once they hit the gate uh, and they have to, you know, show up with their parole agent or the probation officer, uh, you know, as good as we've done, uh, it's hard out there for folks who've, uh, you know, been sober because they've, you know, been surrounded by folks and then what do they do? So the, the mentor programs, um, certainly folks are interested in it. I got to plug the whole St. John's program for real change. I'll plug that. Uh, we still have plenty of needs that are women and children for children, all sorts of stuff. It's just that this part of the of the program is is less volunteer driven, but we still sure. use the the clothing that people donate to St. John's and and the books. The I tell you, they're voracious readers with the 
books and stuff. So those sort of items that are donated to the St. John's program uh, also end up here at CCTRP. Okay, well, that's good to know too. And maybe we can think about that in our community in St. John's, but also, um, you know, if others are listening outside the community, um, if they do have donations, how, like, let's say material donations, like books and stuff, yeah. how do we get those to you in the best way? The uh, material donations uh, during these COVID days, our donation center is open Friday and Saturday. I think it's from like 10 to one and that's at 4410 Power Inn Road, and that's on the St. John's Program website. Uh, don't try to come at another time. You'll, you'll be disappointed and we'll disappoint you. you we'll know? be sitting in the parking lot for a while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, that's, it's, it's really wonderful that folks donate clothing, tennis shoes, work clothes, you know, uh, business clothes, as well as casual clothes, because all are, are useful. Um, because we do have folks who work and some work, you know, we did have previously someone working at Macy's every day. And so they had to dress like they were working at Macy's. Right. And so, uh, they weren't buying clothes. They had to they used the donated clothes. So this, that's how we could use those items. Yeah. Well, is there anything else that you have thought of as we've been talking that you want to share? Um, if anything's come to mind? I would. I would just say one thing that I mentioned at the beginning is um, the stigma of being incarcerated uh, is both for those who are incarcerated and those of us who are on the outside who've never been. Um, yeah. If I was, if I were able to have you stand next to me at 8:30 in the morning, Monday through Friday, at our community meeting, uh, you would never know that the only thing all those women had in common was that they were all uh, convicted of felonies because it doesn't look that way at all. Yeah. Um, and so um, that in Seth, your line, you know, it's almost there before the grace of God go I that I've, you know, not been convicted of, of anything, but the sense that, you know, we talk about, the other being also a child of God. But when that reality is in your, you know, looks so different and has a different uh, world, you know, to, to live with a little more grace, to accept people. Uh, uh, how do, you know, fear comes from lack of knowing. We're often afraid of what we don't know. And I think there's a lot of unknown with incarcerated folks. Uh, but somehow to reduce that fear uh, for folks that um, there there's some delightful folks out there. Yeah, thank you for that. How about you, Seth? Any other comments you want to make? Or? That was yeah. beautiful. I, I would just add that um, this is all of our community and of the literally millions of people that are incarcerated right now, uh, 97 or so percent of them are going to get back out again and are going to return to their community uh, as well as our community. So whatever we can do to make their lives better and their lives more whole and more healed, uh, the better it is for everybody. Um, and rather than thinking of it as an us and them, thinking of it as a, as a shared collective. Yeah. I mean, it's part of our call to love neighbor, right? And, you know, we don't choose who our neighbors are. God presents them to us, right? And how do we love whoever is our neighbor around us? And um, so I think that's an important question for all of our faith communities and really all, all people in our communities. Um, and it's better when we actually reach out in love rather than, you know, continuing to judge and condemn and, you know, treat people as if they're not uh, valuable because um, they certainly are to God, so. Well, thank you both uh, for joining me this afternoon. I really appreciate it. And thank you for sharing about um, this important work. And I hope that um, others will join you in it and find ways to support that, the work that you're doing. Thank you. 